Hi, this is Debbie Q, and you're about to listen to The Right Shoe. This is my first podcast. I am going to be doing The Strange and Mysterious Death of Matthew Larson, a.k.a. Pipus the Wise. That's who most people know him by. I had never heard of Matthew before until he died, unfortunately. And uh, I'm actually naming my podcast after him, The Right Shoe, because... His right shoe was missing and never found. And that seems to be the case with a lot of strange deaths and homicides is for some reason people lose their right shoe. And I have not been able to figure out why. There was uh, that famous case with the, it was on Unsolved Mysteries and most true crime junkies will remember this one. It was, his name was Kurt Sova. He was a young kid and he went to a party one night and he was drinking heavily, which he wasn't used to doing. And I guess his friend wanted to take him out to get him some fresh air. Uh, when he got out, his friend realized it was cold, so he ran back in to get Kurt a jacket. And when he came back, Kurt was gone. They couldn't find him for a couple days, and finally they found him in a ravine, dead. And his right shoe was missing. The same ravine, a, a Eugene Gavet. His right shoe is missing, and he was also found deceased. It just blows my mind. It's not the only three cases where this happens, but most, when I read, I always specifically look if there's a shoe missing to see which one it is. And even, I have to say, as I walk my dog, I see right shoes here and there in the street. It's always the right shoe. I I can't get over it. I'm sure there's left shoes out there missing or found, but it's nine times out of ten, it's the right one. Hence the name of my podcast. Uh, I chose Matthew first because uh, my friend's in homicide, and he tells me a lot of stories. Now, most of the time, especially in the city, big city like this, homicides aren't like you see on TV. It's not like, say, Forensic Files, for example. They go through all this stuff, and they have all these experts, and the blood splatter and all that. The city, there is so many homicides, you can't even get to that. It's You can barely get to who the killer is half the time, unfortunately. It's just like gangs on the street shooting each other because they're taking over their corner or drug related or you stole my girl stuff that seems so insignificant especially like the girlfriend thing it's like you're going to shoot each other over our girl really when there's a million of them out there but that seems to be half the problem and and they're getting younger and younger so city homicides are not the same as the ones you see on TV, not by any shape of the imagination. But I do like when he tells me about them. And I also, when I heard this one, because in the beginning they weren't sure what was going on, there's not really an ending to this story. And it is bizarre. Um, I I looked up Pipus the Wise because that comes up right away. And I... I see people saying that he was on a walk and got hurt hiking, which it's kind of the truth, but it's not really what happened. Um, The story is bizarre, and I'll start with how I was told. Uh, My friend Tom came up to me, and he said, yeah, this kid died last night, and he was just laying in the middle of the field, like frozen almost with his hands like outreached and his pants were like pulled down to his knees and there was like cuts and abrasions all over he said but it was weird it was like he was just placed in the middle of the field like there was nothing around him and i thought wow that's weird what happened and he said well and plus they said something about he was obsessed with this kelpius cave and i didn't know what that was either at the time so i had to look everything up now, the first thing he showed me was this video of Pipus and his friend dancing. So, this is what I first see. 
and here. It is hilarious to watch. It is two guys dancing, Pipus and his friend, and there's a little bag of weed shaking going on. <laughs> it is funny. I mean, but when I first saw it, I I was like, what the heck is this kid doing? And and it was, I thought, oh gosh, what a, you know, what a nut, you know. But then I, I said, let me look him up. So then I'm looking him up and I'm like, well, this kid wasn't an idiot. He he really knew what he was doing. He he had a, a show on YouTube called Public Cinema Cult, which was gaining popularity and it would have broke wide open had given the chance. He was right there. He was so close. He would have made it. He had that certain something that you need to make it. He had it. And uh, especially this one that sticks in my mind. It's called Grave Diggers. It's hilarious. It They're very professionally shot, funny, and, and he was offered $30,000 from ABC Sci-Fi just to make a movie or a documentary or something. And he was going to make like a pseudo documentary about an alchemist who predicts the end of the world. And that's where Kelpius Cape comes in at, which I will get to. Um, so I, as the more I was reading, nobody was saying anything bad about him, which is even more unusual on YouTube. Everything was very positive. Everyone liked him, and, and after his death, you can see how the comments turned to, you know, how sad it was that he was deceased now. And I I will put any links that I can or pictures on my Twitter account, which is The Right Shoe. Also, my if you wanted to email me, it's therightshoe at yahoo.com. And my podcast, which is just starting... But we'll, I will be doing them as fast as I can. Trying for every week. Might be every other week at first. But um, they're going to be listed where all podcasts are. Like Spotify and Stitcher and Apple iTunes. Uh, I, I like podcasts and I, I enjoy listening to them. Especially the true crime ones. I like like Paul Holes and uh, Billy Jensen has a good one. And... Um, Also, the Trace Evidence. Oh my gosh, that's my favorite. I absolutely love that Trace Evidence. So uh, I decided, what the heck, I'll do my own strange and unusual cases because I got a lot of them. I myself am very strange and unusual, so it will fit right in. That, I get back to the story. So he shows me that, I go on, and I'm like impressed. and, And the more I'm looking, the more I'm finding there, there was another article done by a uh, little death press. It's called, I think. I believe that's the publisher. They did an article about the Hover twins. They were DJs in Philadelphia. They, uh, they were all in white and they were on these hoverboards, and it looks really cool. It's a great article and it's a great introduction to them. I, I don't know since his friend is still alive and his partner. I don't want to say his name because I. I don't know how much people want to be known. You know, I feel bad for his partner. He's got to be devastated. Because here, you know, they were moving right along and then this happens. You'll see him anyway if you look everything up. Uh, I just don't want to invade his privacy or whatever. So I I looked all that up and I was getting into what Pipus was all about. I learned that he was from Philadelphia uh, December 9th. 1992 he was born and also that date also has a negative occurrence attached to it his father actually passed away on December 9th of 2017 so this is kind of what stopped that slow growing rocket ship to fame It, it was it's a shame but what happened was um I guess when his dad's date rolled around and it was also his birthday, he started getting depressed. His friends had all experimented with drugs, as every kid, especially every kid in Philadelphia, 
we all experiment with drugs when we're young. It's just the rite of passage in this lovely city. Um, and I say that truthfully. So he, but what happened was he, he got out of that experimentation phase. And when they say, you know, do the drugs, don't let the drugs do you. That is what was happening with Matthew slash Pipus. He was starting to get into the drugs a little too heavily. And that's a real shame because his friend said like he was, he was losing his focus when they would try to, you know, they were trying to do this documentary. It was another project for them. He would stop in the middle and put his phone down and, and, or say, put everyone put their phones down. Uh, they're bugged. Or he was, he was privately talking to someone and saying, I'm an alien. I'm like just strange, bizarre behavior and not making sense trying to get his thoughts together but not having a doing a good job of it they you know all of his friends said the same thing from what i could read they all said that he was becoming scatterbrained and paranoid that's and it was getting worse he he called his mom who was about 600 miles away and he said he had something real important and she had to get up to Philadelphia, and she did. She drove up. This is around February 10th, and he passed away on February 12th of 2019. So within two days' time, by the time she got up here, he was already missing. Which really, it's that it's and and when I get to the most bizarre part, it does get weird when you really think about it. So he. <laughs> He's making it. Everything's going well. And then he hits this rut with his dad's passing. And then he starts to do a drug called Vyvanse. I had never heard of Vyvanse. Apparently, it's like Adderall. It's it's like a speed. It's for ADHD. But people, of course, use it for other things. He said it helped him focus. And perhaps in the beginning it did. But when he started to abuse it... And then, like, ketamine and DMT and a little bit of cocaine and PCP in his system. That's when it starts to not work so well. Especially for focus, because they said he had... He was worrisome how lack of focus he was. So, the Kelpius Cave was a society back in the 1600s, 1694. A group of monks thought that the end of the world was coming so they made up a a group and they made this little cave they actually had a bunch of them but one remains in fairmont park which is a very it's a cute section of philadelphia most people when they hear fairmont park you think of jogging because people are either jogging there or they're having like I know a lot of breast cancer fundraisers are done there. or The juvenile diabetes does theirs there. They used to anyway. And and plus, in the section where Matthew had died, he actually was near a shipping container. And it contained like basketballs and all kinds of sporting equipment for the children to use that go to Fairmont Park, like, I guess, little leagues and daycare centers. It said it was for the children. So that's where he had actually died, was by that shipping container, which is another curious thing. I can't figure out what he was doing on the shipping container. But, again, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So what happened the night that he died was his friend had come into I guess there was a group of them that lived together and his friend had come out and noticed the tag to their survival pack was in the middle of the floor and he said right as soon as I seen the tag without the survival pack he said I knew something was wrong he he, because he wouldn't go without the others and and Usually he didn't go alone to Kelpia's cave. He would he would go for a reason. His friends just became worried automatically. So he knew something was wrong. I guess also the way he had been behaving in the past two weeks was alarming as well. 
So in the interviews, especially the one I read about the uh, caretaker to the mansion, it was called Lemon Hill Mansion, and it's right near where Matthew died. If I could give you a virtual map where Matthew lived, three miles away was this Lemon Hill Mansion. And then three miles kind of north of that was where Kelpius Cave ca comes in. So he was three miles away from Kelpius Cave. I don't think he was on a direct route. And even like from the beginning. So I don't know if it was the drugs that were clouding his mind or something had happened. Because this is what the caretaker said. She said somebody... She was at home in the mansion, which is supposed to be haunted, by the way. So that's scary in and of itself. She was looking out the window. She saw somebody peering into her car, the driver's side window. She became nervous, and she wanted to set the alarm off. So she slammed the door a couple of times. I guess that triggers the alarm. And uh, then she yelled out the door, hey, get away from that car. So he kind of panicked, looked over. But she said when he looked over, she could see him more clearly. And she said, that's what I noticed. It was like a white kid with dreadlocks. But he was moving very awkwardly. And, and he just, he, she thought he was homeless. And he had a red bag near him. And that's what she had observed. She said he was limping so badly or some other traumatic incident happened before he even reached the Lemon Hill Mansion because he was injured. Now, maybe when he was peering into the car, he was trying to see how hurt he was. I'm trying to figure out what he was doing peering into the car. Because that's what triggered the girl to yell at him. And that's what triggered him to move further down. It's called Boxer's Trail. She said he went up to Boxer's Trail. But he was moving very slowly. And it looked like painfully. So, he, you know, she... Okay, he's gone. So she figures he's gone. But she does see him reach for the, this red bag before she goes out. When she comes back that night, she sees police in, in, like, further up, like about a third of a mile down. And so she went to see what was going on, and they said, oh, you know, she's, right away she saw somebody lying on the ground. She couldn't see who it was first, but she saw the red bag. She said as soon as she saw that red bag, she knew it was, that, it was him, like the same guy she had seen earlier. So she said, the police said, do you know this gentleman? And she said, no, but I saw that red bag. Then I don't know if they brought her closer to him or if they showed a picture of him. I'm not sure. But the image she was shown, she said, that's definitely him. That's the gentleman I saw. That's the bag he was, uh, he was holding. And she told him how bad he was limping and everything. So when my friend, he was called after this first responders because they still didn't know what had happened. They were thinking he got shot because they could see that he fell off the, the shipping container. But again, his pants were down around his knees, which I can't figure that out. I know when people do certain drugs, sometimes they get real hot and they try to take off their clothes, but it was freezing this night. I can't imagine that's the case here. I don't understand that. And he had a lot of... He had a contusion in his eye. He had several bruising on his buttocks. And like lower region. And his toe was broken. I, I can't... I'll get into what what the ultimately think happened. But it's still listed as pending. But... My friend said when he walked up, he said the way he was laying, he said, and after she was talking about how, you know, like kind of spooky the mansion was, like 
She said her daughter won't even sleep there because one night she came over and she saw a ghost and she was so scared she she will not sleep in that mansion. And that seems to be the case with a lot of mansions in the Strawberry Mansion section of Philadelphia. I hear that it's old mansions that I guess have a lot of history and you know, I guess the detectives just thought that was really interesting. He said, when she said that, he said, I was kind of getting spooked because his hand was like reaching up almost towards something away. And he was thinking, what did he see? A ghost? Like, what happened? You know, it, it freaks you out. In the meantime, his friends are looking all over for him. And the detective who was there... I think he didn't really take them too seriously until it came back to that red bag. When they said he was carrying a red bag and then they went back and forth with the detectives on the scene. They said that's him because he had a red bag with his cell phone, a couple. He didn't have his wallet. His wallet he had left home. But he had a couple of discs laying. It, they were in the bag. They must have fallen out. And a notebook. His friends were later given that. But it was, it was, you know, it was sad because it's in the middle of cold winter night and everything's frozen. And what they think happened is he ran down Boxer's Trail and tried to, he did, he got on top of this shipping container, which is eight feet tall. And he's tall too. He was about six foot. So that's not a huge leap. But this shipping container... I think I have a picture of that somewhere. But there's nothing really to grab onto. But he got on top of it. And there's a tree next to it. So something either startled him or scared him. And he fell out. And the reason his hands were reaching out is they think he tried to grab for the branches. So when he was laying there, his hands were like up. Like reaching up, if that makes any sense. And it, it just looked bizarre. So ultimately, even after doing the autopsy, he really didn't have enough drugs in him to be an overdose. I, I mean, it could be the elements because it was cold. But it, mostly they think he got whiplash when he fell backwards. And that caused like the kind of... It, it says blunt trauma, but... um. Blunt trauma to the neck, consistent with whiplash. The manner of death will be listed as undetermined until other corroborating evidence are located. PCP was also found in the decedent system. Based on the interviews and processing of the scene, it is believed that the male fell from a tree and struck a branch during his fall to the ground. Even as far as December of 2019, there's nothing else it's just listed as pending. So that's that was a curious story to me. Uh, that was my first story, and it was short, but I, I wanted to get that one out there because it stuck in my head for this whole time since I heard it, which was like the day after February of 2019. It's March of 2020, so for a year now, i just been thinking of this poor kid and how he, he was just walking along. And that, every time I really think about it, it drives me crazy. He was, he was at this car. So he goes further up the trail, hops on top of the shipping container. I don't know why. If he was going to Kelpia's cave, why didn't he keep walking that way? Or ask somebody for help or something. I mean... Was he, I don't know, sometimes, you know, when you're that high and if he had really just gotten, maybe he was just so confused or scared and trying to hide because she said she was going to call the cops or yelled out the window, get away from that car. Yeah, I called the cops. So maybe he was scared and jumped up and then what caused him? Did he just fall? Did something startle him? Was he trying to get down and then... He just slipped. It, it was a big shipping container. But, man, it still freaks me out. It's that cold winter's night. Uh, the last place you want to be is on top of a shipping container in the middle of Fairmont Park. But, 
It makes me sad. And for this, Matthew, the right shoe number one is for you. Um, I will be doing more strange and unusual deaths. Sometimes they will be homicides. Sometimes they won't. The next one I want to do is about the black metal. Uh, what do they call them? The black metal bands. God, that's it. Sounds terrible. That I don't even know what they call them. But it's because it's such a fascinating story. I kept saying black metal death band, but it's just black metal band of mayhem in the 90s or in the 80s there was a band called mayhem and there was a i guess Euronymous had started it I, I didn't read everything yet so don't bash me but death was also in it this guy named dead his, his real name was pell p-e-l-l-e -L -L -E. i'll get all these names straight i promise you because i want to i want to figure this story out I know what happened, but it is so bizarre. And that's going to be my next one. And then my third one will be about my friend Tina, who was murdered in 1986. And I always tried to get her story out there. And, you know, I would write to people and they wouldn't, you know, write back or whatever. That Which is fine. But I did want to tell the story because I don't want her to ever be forgotten. And then we'll go from there. But for now, that was my first, not my last. And it's Debbie Q with the right shoe. Bye-bye for now.